The Witch in the Wood by T. H. White, Chapter Thirty. Sir Grumor and Sir Palamidas won the drawbridge by a short head, and it was drawn up after them in the nick of time. It was not raised and lowered with so much excitement on two consecutive days within living memory, and everybody was delighted. Ew, said Sir Grumor, unbuttoning the back end and standing up to mop his brow. Hooch, said Mother Morlin, who was in the castle delivering some eggs. <clears throat> St. Terilvac had politely carried them up for her. We sleek it, cowering, timorous beastie, said the drawbridge man. Oh, what a panic's in thy breastie. All right, us, said the bystanders. Bonny Sir Padamidas, said Pudsey, who had come up with Mother Morlin and her fiancé in the hope of a free drink at the buttery, is going to lay him down and dee. They turned round to examine the painting and found that it was as Pudsey said. Sir Palamidas had collapsed on a stone mounting block without troubling to take his head off, and he was breathing heavily. They took it off for him and threw a bucket of water in his face. Then Mother Moreland fanned him with her apron. Up the pier, churl, they said compassionately. The Sanach, the Sassane, the Sable Savage. He will no come back, will he no come back again? Gee him any the drapey there. Ah, the bra splash. Sir Palamidas revived slowly, blowing bubbles out of his nose. Where is yours truly? He asked. Here we are, old boy. We got back safe. The beast's outside. Through the portacollis there came a sorrowful howling to bear out Sir Grumor's statement, as it had been thirty couple of hounds baying at the moon. Sir Palamidas shuddered. A narrow beard cut, said he. We ought to look out to see if Pedanor's coming. Yes, yeah, Sir Grumor, allow us one sec for recuperation. The beast may have done him a mischief. Poor fellow! How do you feel yourself? The indisposition is passing, said Sir Palamidas bravely. Not much time to waste. It may be eating him at this very moment. Lead on, said the Paynim, heaving himself to his feet. Forward to the battlements. So the whole party set off to climb the narrow stairs of the North Tower. They plodded up past the doors of the falconer's room and of Sir Palamidas's chamber, their iron shoes or heavy clogs clattering and clopping on the stone steps which wound through the thickness of the wall. They passed the guard room and stood gingerly among the flower beds which topped the keep. There was nothing to be seen from here, so down they went again, but this time passed out through Sir Palamidas's room on the battlements above the armory. They passed along these and entered the gatehouse, stooping at a small door. Then it was out into the east sunlight then it was out into the sunlight again, and up the worn cold stairs of the east tower until they could look out from the top. Down below them, looking quite small and upside down from this height, the questing beast could be seen sitting in the ravine which bounded the castle on that side. She was sitting on a boulder in it with her tail in, in the burn, and she was looking up at the drawbridge with her head on one side. Her tongue was hanging out. Nothing could be seen of King Pelinor, neither in the ravine nor on the slope behind which led up past Bowling Green and Rose Garden to the darksome pines. Evidently she isn't eaten him, said Sir Grumor. Unless she's eaten him, said Sir Palamidas. I think she would, I hardly think she would have time to do that. She would have had time to do that, old boy. Not in the time. You would think she would have left some bones or something, or at any rate the armor. Quite. What do you think we ought to do? Seems a bit baffling. Do you think we ought to make a sortie or something? We can wait and see what happens, Palamidas, don't you think? No leaps, assented, the pa assented Sir Palamidas, without previous looks. After they had been watching for half an hour or so, the Terilovec faction grew bored with the lack of entertainment. They clattered off down the stairs to throw stones at the questing beast off the top of the gatehouse. The two knights stayed on the lookout. This is a pretty state of affairs, remarked Sir Grumor after a bit. Indeed it is, Sir Grumor. I mean, when you work it out, exactly. Here's the Queen Raven on the one side, and Pelinor on the other, and you're supposed to be in love with La Beale Isole, isn't it? And there's Torelovec and Mother Morlin, and now the Beast is after both of us. A confusing situation. Love. 
said Sir Grammore uneasily, is a pretty strong thing when you come to think of it. At this moment, as if to confirm Sir Grammore's opinion, a pair of enlaced figures sauntered out of the far trees. As a tactical dist- at a tactical distance between them, a third figure emerged, wandering from side to side and ostentatiously picking flowers. Good gracious, exclaimed Sir Grummel. What are those? As they drew nearer, their identity became clear. One of the first two was King Pellinore, and he had his arm round the waist of a stout middle-aged lady in a side-saddle skirt. She had a red horsey face and carried a hunting crop in her free hand. Her hair was in a bun. It must be the Queen of Flanders' daughter. And one, and the one behind, cried Sir Gromor, is old Merlin for a dollar. Yes, it is. And merciful powers, look at his boots. Even in the distance, they could see that Merlin was wearing so monstrous a pair of boots for his walking tour that if you had pushed him over, he would probably have sprung upright again. He sauntered along, looking everywhere except at the lovers. He had a sort of haversack on his back and looked in the best of health. He was all sleek and silver and shining, like an eel preparing for its long nuptial journey to the Sargasso Sea, for the time of Nemu was at hand. I say, you two, shouted King Pellinore as soon as he had observed them. I say, look here, what do you think? Can you guess? Whoever would have thought it, what? What do you think I've found? Aha! cried the stout lady in a deep, booming voice archly tapping his cheek with her hunting crop. But who did the finding, eh? Yes, yes, I know. It wasn't me that found her at all. It was she who found me. And what what do you think of that? Fancy finding me. Aren't we to be introduced? Isn't it usual, don't you think? The stout lady took control of the situation. I'm the Princess of Flanders, she shouted jovially. I found old Pelly in the wood. How do you do? yelled Sir Grumor. I'm Grumor. Hail! squealed Sir Palamidas. Nice day! they all proclaimed. And do you know what? went on the king in high delight. None of my letters could possibly be answered. I never put on a dress on them. I always knew there was something wrong, so old Piggy got on her horse, you know, and came hunting after me by moor and fell. Merlin had joined the group by now. And this is old Merlin, what? She ran into him on the way back from Bedigrain, and he led her to me by his negromantic arts. Good old Merlin, imagine his being able to do that. It was just my backside, sighed Merlin modestly. But why are we standing here? shouted the king. He was so excited that nobody else had time to talk. I mean to say, why are we shouting so? Is it polite, do you think? Oughtn't you two to come down and let us in? What's wrong with this drawbridge, anyway? It's the beast, Pedinor, the beast. She's in the ravine. What's wrong with the beast? She's besieging the castle. Oh, yes, said the king. Now I remember she bit me. And what do you think? He went on, waving one hand in the air to show that it was bandaged. Piggy tied it up for me like one o'clock. She tied it up with a bit of well, her, you know. Petticoats, boomed the Queen of Flanders' daughter. Yes, yes, her petticoats. The king was convulsed with giggles. It's all very well, Pelinor. That's all very well. But what are you going to do about the beast? His majesty was quite intoxicated with gaiety. Oh, the beast, he cried recklessly. Is that the only trouble? I'll soon settle her. Now then, he exclaimed, marching to the edge of the ravine and waving his sword. Now then, off you go. Shoo, shoo. The questing beast looked up at him absently. She moved her tail in a vague gesture of recognition and returned her attention to the gatehouse. The occasional stones which were being thrown at her by the Terelevec faction, she dexterously caught and swallowed in the maddening way which chickens have when you try to drive them off. Let down the drawbridge, commanded the king. I'll attend to her. Shoo now, shoo. The drawbridge was lowered with some hesitation and the beast immediately drew closer to it with an expectant expression. Now then, cried the king, you two rush in while I defend the rear. The drawbridge reached the ground and Merlin was speeding across it before it touched. Bang, bang, went his gigantic boots. King Pellinor and the Queen of Flanders' daughter, less agile or more bemused by the gentle passion, collided in the gateway. The questing beast ran into them behind, knocking the king flat. 
Beware, beware, cried all the retainers, fishwives, falconers, farriers, fletchers, and other well-wishers who were assembled within. The queen of Flanders' daughter turned like a tigress to defend her young. Be off, you shameless hussy, she cried, bringing her hunting crop down in a swinging blow upon the creature's nose. The questing beast recoiled with tears springing to its eyes, and the porticullis crashed between them. And that's the end of chapter 30.